Romans chapter 10 this morning. 11 through 13 will be our text. And before I jump in, I was going to ask for uh, for you guys to be praying. We we uh, some of you who have been around since last summer, you know, we started doing some some dirt work out in the parking lot, and uh, so obviously parking lot's been an issue for a lot of years, and it's been a long time coming to get things moving in, in that direction to get a parking lot. And of course, springtime when it's muddy, uh, we recognize what a blessing it would be to have (laughs) something more than mud and dirt out there. So um, we've been making plans. We we met this last week with our our parking lot crew. And um, so, you know, we We've done some pricing in the past, and, and it just always seemed like um, doing a, having somebody do a parking lot for us would just be way, way, way out of reach. Um, and so we started putting our heads together, and we, you know, it's always neat to see how God puts puzzle pieces together in the body. So we've got folks here who know how to run heavy equipment and know how to do uh, a lot of the prep work that needs to be done. And we just, one of our guys here bought a grader, and so we've got all kinds of neat things happening. And so we're, we're praying about the best way to go about doing that. So we've been talking about doing um, millings out there. And millings are basically old asphalt roads that they grind up and then they put it back down. So it's kind of like asphalt, but not exactly. Um, way cheaper option. Um, and so, you know, in order to make that work, though, we got to be able to, number one, find millings. And that's been challenging the last few years. So... All that to say, um, for that to work, there's a lot of things that need to fall into place. And so we could sure use prayers on um, what direction to go. God's been incredibly, um, he, he's blessed us incredibly over the last few years. I mean, when COVID hit, I expected that the finances would, would tank and they went the other direction. And so it's been an amazing blessing to see um, things that we haven't been able to do for years because we didn't have the money. We have money to do some of those things. And so we, we want to be wise stewards. And, um, you know, we also just love to see God step in and, and do things that we don't expect. So if you guys would help us by praying, that would be a tremendous blessing. So anyway, it's always good when the saints get behind these things and start praying. So Romans chapter 10. I'm excited this morning. I've been waiting for this one for a while. So our text, again, 11 through 13, but I'm going to start in verse 9, if you don't mind standing, as we read from God's Word. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Lord, we ask that you'd bless our time this morning in your word, that you'd pour out your spirit on us, that we would hear, Lord, all that you desire to speak to our minds and our hearts and our lives, our situations. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So quick recap from last week. We, we talked about how a person can be born again. And it's incredibly simple. The text last week gave us that answer. Confess. person declares with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Good, you can cheat, it's in your Bible. I gave an example last week of a young guy making confession of his love to his hopefully bride-to-be as he, as he uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Proposes, there it is, as he makes his proposal to his gal. And a wise fellow wouldn't just propose by saying, hey woman, marry me. Unless he's an idiot, that that just wouldn't work. A wise fellow would declare, he would confess his love for his gal. 
he would confess that he longs for a future with her and wants to be one with her and beg, begs and pleads for her hand in marriage. Hugely important to confess in that context. We understand that. How much more important to confess that Jesus is Lord if we're wanting to have a relationship with him. We also talked about the gal being proposed to, that in order for her to be able to, to move forward in that relationship, she would be wise to have that deep down core of her being belief that he really loves her and that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her and that he's going to love her as Christ loves the church. If, if she doesn't have that deep down core belief, she'd be foolish to move forward in that relationship. We also talked last week about confession and belief that if those things are genuine in a person's life, it will be life-altering. Lots of people proclaim and, and declare that they're Christians. They, they give lip service. They say the stuff. But if there's no life change, if there's no heart change, if there's no direction change in their life, then... That salvation, in my opinion, and I think according to the scriptures, is, is suspect at best. So we continue on this morning in verse 11. And verse 11 is, in my estimation, as I've been studying through and, and teaching through, we get to 11, 12, and 13. And, it, and to me, it's kind of an exclamation mark that Paul puts on things that he's been saying over and over and over again up to this point in Romans. And then for those of you that know what's coming, the, the verses that we'll start in our next study, it's, it's kind of a transition point in Paul's mind. He's been declaring up to this point, he'll declare it, boom, 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 exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark in 11, 12, and 13. And then we're going to see that what, what God has been offering over and over and over again, Paul makes it evident one more time, and then he transitions to, now, you guys, believers, guess what? You have a responsibility to go declare that truth, to, to declare that gospel, to share with others the good news. So, verse 11, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And I'll flip back to Isaiah 28. Paul quotes from Isaiah 28, verse 16, and this will be familiar to some of you guys who have been studying with us. He actually quoted this same verse back in chapter 9, verse 33. So Isaiah 28, verse 16. See, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I have laid a stone in Zion a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. And the one who trusts in him will never be dismayed or put to shame. Of course, that's referring to Jesus as the chief cornerstone. The most important, we talked about this when we were in chapter 9, the most important piece of the building. Everything rises from that chief cornerstone. It ties the walls together. And so Jesus, of course, he is that chief cornerstone. He's the most important part of this building called the church that he's building. And we're all built on him. And we talked about, and we'll study it next week, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. We talked about how Jesus went into Jerusalem that day in, in fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament, an, an incredible day prophetically. And by and large, the religious leaders rejected him, didn't want to have anything to do with him as the Messiah. And so, sadly, we see the original chosen people of God, by and large, rejected him. They didn't embrace him as their Messiah. They didn't want to have him come to save them for their, from their sins. And so, sadly, what Jesus did was, was in vain. People he came to save didn't, didn't want him, so he, he took his proverbial ball and he ascended back up to heaven and he gave up on mankind. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Jesus went to the cross and Jesus rose again. And then a, a, 
a major transition took place. And we, we see this in the book of Acts, specifically with, with a guy named Peter. The gospel went out not just to Jews, but to Gentiles. And literally, the entire world was changed. The gospel became available to all people. Now, if you look at verse 11, the word there for trusts is the same word that we saw in, in both verses 9 and 10 last week. Those of you who are here studying with us, the word for trusts is pistuo in the Greek. And Paul will use it seven times in chapter 10 alone. So in Paul's mind, it's a major theme. He uses it 21 times in the book of Romans. All the way through, we see this, this emphasis on belief, on pistuo, Shouldn't surprise us, because when you study the teachings of Jesus, pastuo was a major point of emphasis for him. You see it most, uh, most notably in John 3.16. We talked about that last week. The word there is, is pastuo in John 3.16. And so it means to have faith in, to put confidence or trust in, or to rely upon. Very simple. We talked last week, I gave the example of, of my girls when, when they were little and I would come home from work and they would run out, Daddy, Daddy. And, and I would often grab them and throw them up into the air. And, and, and they had no idea that their, their life was literally in jeopardy. If I dropped them on their head, they would be dead. They had no clue. It was just, ah, because they had faith. Pistuo. They trusted in me as their dad. Next, in verse 11, look at the word shame. It means to disgrace or put to the blush, cause you to blush, or to be confounded or to dishonor. Now, I want you to keep the big picture in mind here in verse 11. If you're a follower of Jesus in this world, increasingly, in the world that we're living. Without question, the enemy, the world, those who are being marionetted by the enemy, there are, there are without question going to be attempts by the enemy and those who, who he influences to try to bring shame upon you, to try to confound you. We see this just increasingly in our society and in our culture those who want to stand for things that are right and true, biblical, logical, they're going, to be, they're going to be shamed and they're going to be ridiculed and they're going to be dishonored in this society. And of course, we understand, hopefully, that it's an attempt of the enemy to, to shut you up. It's an attempt of the enemy to keep you from exposing their fruitless deeds of darkness, the enemies, the world's. And so I don't believe, as you look at verse 11, I don't believe that you and I are excluded or, or that um, we can expect that these things won't happen from the world. I think they will. And I think a believer needs to be wise and expect that the world will try to bring shame and disgrace on us. But there's a promise in, in verse 11 for us, for those who choose to, to put their trust, their pistuo in Jesus. We understand as believers, and hopefully it's something that we remind ourselves often, that there is one ultimate judge overall. Now we don't, we don't see him in judgment like we want him to be, perhaps right now, but we understand and we know that eventually all things will be brought underneath his lordship. All things will be made right. The world and the ways of the world, the Bible says, will pass away. And so we keep that in mind. We remember that. We cling to that. The person who trusts in Jesus, it doesn't really matter what the world says about you or what the world says to you because you know what's coming. You know who the judge is. No amount of shame brought against you, no amount of, of the world trying to dishonor you will affect your destination. We know where we're going. We know where our, where our home is. 
And so we put our confidence, our trust, our pastuo in that. You with me? All right. Verse 12. For there is, <clears throat> excuse me, no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Now, there is, of course, a very significant difference between a Jew and a Gentile, genetically. And this has always been a focal point for the enemy. Always. Read back in your Bibles about a guy named Pharaoh. There was a, a big difference in his mind. He made a differentiation. Read about a guy named Hitler. He understood there's a difference there. In the world that we're living today, the modern media is obsessed with the difference. It's unbelievable to me. It's not surprising because we've seen it all through history. But we see media focusing on this in our day. And folks, I sadly don't think it's going to it's going to stop or come to an end. And the reason is, to me, very simple. The enemy focuses on the difference between Jew and Gentile because God focused on the difference between Jew and Gentile. He said, these people, these Jewish people, are my chosen people. And so the enemy says, oh, they're God's chosen people? I'll just leave them alone then. Of course, it's why the enemy comes against the Jewish people because they're still his chosen people. And it's why the enemy comes against you, because you are his chosen people now, those of you who are believers, right? It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't, so it shouldn't shock us. I digress here, though. Sorry, a little rabbit trail. So genetically, of course, there's differences between Jew and Gentile. But Paul's not talking about genetics here. He's talking about the gospel. And it, he says it doesn't matter. Jew or Gentile, they're both sinners in need of a savior. They're all sinful and in need of a savior. So Paul ties us back here to verse 9 where he used the word Lord there, kurios in the Greek. It means, as we talked about last week, last week, the supreme in authority. And so Paul is tying us back into verse 9, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And he says, guys, it doesn't matter if a person's a Jew or a Gentile. What matters is who the Lord of their life is. So who's Lord of your, yeah, Jesus. Who's Lord of your life? Jesus, yeah, same answer. <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe that'll change uh, today if he's not Lord of your life yet. So, oy vey. come on, Trav. Verse 12 comes with, to me, an incredible promise here. And it's not just in the context of salvation. I think there, there is implied the context of salvation. But as you look again at verse 12, it mentions that there's rich blessing. And literally, verse 12 would read that he is rich towards all who call on him. He is rich towards all who call on him, which of course means that if you're a believer, you're going to be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams in this life, right? The prosperity gospel folks would try to convince you of that, but of course that's not biblical and it's not reality. If it was, Jesus would have been the wealthiest man to ever walk the face of the earth, right? So am I saying that believers can't be wealthy? Of course not. I know quite a few very wealthy believers and, and the vast majority of them are incredibly generous with what God has blessed them with. But understand this, folks, God doesn't owe you a lot of money in this life. God doesn't really owe you anything. So <clears throat> I, I notice this in verse 12, and I, I'm going to call your attention to it. It doesn't say in verse 12 that he's rich toward those who complain to him or who complain about him. Those who complain to him or about him have a pride issue. Because the Bible is incredibly clear, he is always good. And he is always worthy of our praise and adoration, regardless of whether or not things are going our way in life. 
He's also rich towards those who call on him because calling on him implies humility. You're calling out for the help of the Lord. And so it implies humility. God, you guys know this, he, he always blesses those who are humble. He opposes the proud, but he always blesses those who are humble. You guys, if, if you want to do an exercise, it's kind of a fun one. Get a notebook and start writing all the ways that God has blessed you. Oh, I, I can't, Pastor Trav. He hasn't blessed me. My life is so miserable and hard. <laughs> the most blessed people on the planet aren't those who have the most stuff, but those who most appreciate what they do have. Those are the people that are blessed. You show me a discontent, depressed, bummed out person, and I'd be willing to bet money that that person is more focused on their problems than they are on God's blessings in their life. I'd be willing to bet that they're more focused on what they don't have than what God has blessed them with. I'd be willing to bet that they're more focused on what they think God owes them than what they owe to God. Being blessed, hopefully we know this. It's not about stuff, folks. It's a mindset of thankfulness for all the goodness that God has given and will continue to give. So if you're one of those, get a notebook and start writing down the things that God has blessed you with. And the more you do it, I guarantee, the more you will pay attention to all of those things. I mean, if you walk outside after church today and the sun's still shining, there's an opportunity to give God thanks for something that he's blessed you with. And if it's raining, you can do the same thing. It's a little more of a blessing when the sun is shining this time of year, but... <laughs> I'm speaking another language today. Verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is one of my most frequently referenced verses. I mention it almost every time I give an, an invitation for folks to respond to the gospel. Of course, it's strategic on my part. The reason is simple because what Paul is saying is very simple. So incredibly simple. We make the gospel so complicated, but it's not, folks. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word is sozo for saved there. We talked about this a little bit last week. It means to be saved or delivered, rescued, healed, protected, preserved, or made whole. Very, very broad stroke there. It's in the context of salvation. But I mention this over and over and over. For those of you who have perhaps been saved for a lot of years, it doesn't just end at the point of salvation. It's something that we should need and recognize our need for all throughout our walk with God. Because if you're honest, even if you're not honest, I know because I've talked to some of you, that life has a way of slapping us across the face. And we find ourselves in situations where we're confused and we're frustrated and we're broken and we're hurting and life isn't working out the way that we thought that it should. And it's in those situations that we need Sozo, to be made whole, to be delivered, to be rescued, to be set free, healed, whatever, all of the above, and much more, over and over and over again. It's kind of like if you study in the book of Acts, you know, people get hung up on being baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they'll have, you know, it's this, and it's this, and they got all these, you know, theologies that they build of these things, and I just think if you read through the book of Acts and you read through the New Testament, yeah, you need to be baptized with the Spirit over and over and over and over and over again. All the time. Be filled continually. If you look at it in the original language. Be saved continually. Oh, I don't need to be saved. I got it all together, Pastor Trav. Okay. Let me know how that works out for you. I know I need to be saved over and over and over again. So those who 
are going to find salvation and deliverance and healing and rescue and protection and wholeness. The solution is, the way that you get there is to do what? What does it tell us there? Verse 13. You call out to him. You just call out to him. I, my brain is weird, as you guys know. And when I think of verse 13, I always think of that scene in Titanic. If you haven't seen Titanic, this won't make any sense to you. But at the end of the movie where you know, the, all the dead bodies are floating out there in the water, and, and the rowboat comes through, and they're looking for people that are alive. And, you know, Rose is there, and she's on her little thing that she's floating on, and she hears the, the rescue boat coming, and she starts talking to Jack. But Jack is a popsicle. And, and if you look closely, I just watched this, this scene again yesterday. He's got little snot icicles, popsicles coming from his nose. I mean, he's deader than a doornail. And she finally realizes it, and, and so she has to make a decision there. I know it's goofy, but she really, you watch the movie, she has to make a decision. Am I going to stay here and, and die with Jack? Or am I going to call out so I can be rescued? I didn't really realize it the first however many times I've seen the show, but when you watch that scene again, she actually kind of like, I think he's frozen to her and stuck to her and she kind of breaks you know, and it cracks. And she just pushes him away, like, bye, Jack, and you just see him floating down. And, and there's, I mean, there's a whole lot of amazing imagery there when you think about what's happening and how that relates to what I'm talking about here, right? If you want to be saved, just like Rose, you have to make a decision to let loose of the dead stuff and to call out. You have to make a choice. So you think about calling out to him. You think about what, that, what this promise means in verse 13. It doesn't say that you can call out to him and be saved unless you're going through this really bad situation in life. Then, then you, don't, you don't deserve to be saved. There's no, there's no caveat there. We can be saved regardless of what we're going through in life, if we call out. Again, it implies humility. He's not going to force salvation on anyone, though, folks. He will never force anyone to call out to him. And unlike that scene in Titanic when, when the boat is, the rescue boat is rowing further and further away and you know, Rose is calling out, help, help, and she can't do it. And so we're worried that she's not going to be saved. You know, God knows who needs to be saved. He knows the condition of every person on this planet. He knows everyone's heart. But sadly, many people don't recognize their condition. And, and again, in our next text, that's where you and I come in. Because we don't want to end our race. We don't want to finish our race in this life and realize when you read the book of Ezekiel, this makes more sense that we have blood on our hands if we fail to tell people how they can be saved and we stay silent. Sadly, many are just too prideful to cry out. They think that they're the captain of their own destiny and, and little do they know they're not at all behind the wheel of the the ship, they're, they're in the water about ready to drown and die in their sin. Some would say, well, Trav, why doesn't God save everybody? If he knows they need saving, even if they don't recognize it, why doesn't he just save them all? You're asking me questions way above my pay grade there. Why do you ask me questions like that? But again, we'll, we'll talk about that in our next study. Folks, that's where, that's where we come in. 
we've been given the best news that this world is ever going to hear. You've been given the cure to every disease, every sickness known to man, every problem. You have the cure. You have the solution, the gospel. We know what the solution is. We have to tell people. Second reason, or the second answer, I guess I would give to that question, why doesn't God just save everyone? Have you ever tried to save somebody that doesn't want to be saved? Many of you have interacted with loved ones and friends, perhaps spouses caught in addiction, and you do everything you can to try to save them and pull them out of that and and get them to recognize the, the disaster that they're headed for. And typically what happens, the more you push the more they hate you because they don't want to be rescued from that. And you can't force them to be rescued. Those of you who have interacted with folks who are are perhaps even believers who get caught up in an adulterous affair and you try and you plead with them to come to their senses and and to, to forsake that sinful relationship, come back to your spouse And very often, most often, they just push you away and they don't, they they unfriend you and you're done. So, is that a hard one? Is that one that I wrestle with? Of course. God loves all people, and I believe passionately God wants all people to be saved. But if God forced someone, would that be love? Never couldn't be love if God forced somebody to do something against their will. So we'll wrestle with these more in our, in our, next, in our next study. But I'm going to stop at verse 13 this morning, and, and I believe that, at least in my mind, it's an important place to stop because of what we've seen in our three verses this morning. Verse 11, verse 12, verse 13. Paul just, again, he puts the exclamation mark on three different times of what he's been saying all through the book of Romans. And to me, he does it pretty emphatically. You notice in verse 11, I told you to take note of of the word anyone, or if I didn't, I should have. The word anyone there, you'll never guess what that means in the original language. Yeah. In verse 12, a different word is used, All, and it's used twice. You'll never guess what all means in the original language. Okay, now, if we didn't get it in 11 and 12, Paul gives us another verse, verse 13. He uses another word, everyone, and you'll never guess what that means in the original language. Three different verses, three different ways of saying the same thing. The gospel salvation is for anyone, it's for all people, it's for everyone. Over and over and over. I I did this yesterday. I went back, I started at the beginning of Romans and I just read through. And I counted all the different places where, and sometimes you have to you have to dig in and really pay attention to what Paul is saying, but you know, the context. But at least that I found 28 different times from from the beginning of Romans to this point, ending with these last three, 11, 12, and 13 exclamation marks, where Paul says salvation is for everyone, all people. He makes the statement over and over and over again in a myriad of different ways. You are not going to get a clearer presentation of the gospel and the simplicity of the gospel than in Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. If you're not born again this morning, man, you picked a perfect day to come to church. Or your spouse picked a perfect day to drag you to church. Whatever the case, you're here and God wants to save you. He longs to save you. I was uh, a little guy that was born in, in Hawaii. Dad was in the Navy and so I was born in Hawaii. And uh, I was a towhead, really, really towhead. And so, you know, a lot of Oriental people in, in uh, the Hawaiian Islands, and so they just, they love to touch me because 
like apparently in their culture, when you have white hair, it's like important or something. So they would come up and touch me, and it would freak mom out, and you know, dad would get kind of defensive, and they got used to it. But we we lived uh, in a number of different places when I was over there. But one of the the last places that we lived was on a, a really busy street right in front of the house, and and I was a uh, not much has changed, but I was a pretty active little guy. I started walking at seven months, apparently. And so, you know, those of you who are, have raised a kid and you get to that point of them almost walking and you're so excited for them to take their first steps and then you realize after they start walking, what have I done? What is happening here? My life just got so much harder. So my folks' lives got real, a lot harder when I started walking. And so, you know, of course, they would try to explain to a toddler don't go out by the busy road. And I was a toddler, so you know I knew better than my folks, and cars look fun, and so that was always a temptation apparently for me. But we had a dog named Moni, and I, I don't... I asked mom, she couldn't remember. Dad would have known, but of course dad is in heaven, so... Um, I don't know exactly what... I think it was some kind of, you know, like a not a sheep dog, but a dog that was kind of, you know, bred to, to herd things. It, it, was, it was in this dog. And so one day, Dad had lost track of me for, for a, a few seconds, and I was apparently on my way to the busy street. And Dad saw me almost into the street, and the dog had grabbed onto my diaper and was pulling on me to keep me from going into the street. Moni was the dog's name. Did I mention that already? Yeah, okay. So you'll never guess what I was doing to that dog as the dog was trying to keep me from running into the traffic. I was petting it and kissing it. and oh, He's such a good puppy. What do you think I was doing? I was screaming and I was hitting and I was pulling its hair because the dog was not allowing me to do the thing that I wanted to do. That would have killed me. Without question. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, I guarantee you, I can promise you that he's been trying to save you from an eternity separated from him in hell for a long, long time. I guarantee it. You may not recognize <clears throat> you may not recognize it yet, but I guarantee that's been happening in your life. He has sent people into your life. You've had things happen, you've had warnings from him. And the things that you've been living for and pursuing are not bringing life to your soul, and you know it. And perhaps you've been doing what I did to that dog and you've been, you've been fighting and just kicking and screaming. And the hound of heaven is relentless in his pursuit of you. He's not going to give up. You might keep rejecting him and pushing him away. And many of us did that for a lot of years before we got saved. I, let, let me warn you if, you, if you keep doing that, Every time you reject him, you will get a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. That's why the Bible says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I look back on that story and I recognize that there was a whole bunch going on in that story in my life, a lot more than a, than a smart dog who apparently loved a fat, chubby little toddler. There was a whole lot more going on there. There was a God who was intervening in that situ situation supernaturally, using a dog to keep a dumb little kid from wandering out into the street and getting killed because God had a plan for my life. And God has a plan for your life. And he's been working and working and working and working trying to get your attention and perhaps you've been fighting and kicking and screaming and he's not going to quit and my prayer is that you you just you give in. 
Perhaps I'm the dog today. No, I'm not pulling on your diaper, but <laughs> hopefully you're not wearing any. But maybe I'm the dog today. And, and my annoying voice is just, oh, this guy won't stop. And maybe it's, it's enough to get your attention, to get you to step back and to recognize what's going on in your life, that the hound of heaven has been after you since the day you were born. He knew about you from before you were brought into this world. And he's pursuing you and pursuing you. And if you're resisting him, I just ask you, why? Why? Think back to Rose. Why? What possible reason would you have to not want to be saved? What good reason do you possibly have where your eternity hangs in the balance? Folks, there's no good reason. Stop running. Stop fighting him. Stop kicking and screaming. So call out to him today. What does he want me to do? Do I have to go up front and sing and dance? And you just call out, Lord, save me. You can do it while we're singing the last song so that nobody hears you. But man, if you need to be saved, call out to him today. You are on your way to hell if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't trusted him as your Savior. And that might offend you, but I'd rather offend you than to see you or know that you spend an eternity apart from God because I was foolish enough to not say anything to you. The Bible's incredibly clear on this, folks. There's only two places in eternity. And you don't get there any other way than through Jesus. He alone provided the way to have a relationship with the Father. My sin, our sin, all of our sin separates us from God and there's no way to deal with that sin except by p- pistuo, Believing in Jesus, clinging to him, adhering to him, relying on him. It's your only hope. Call out to him today. And if you do, come tell me. Because it'll be the best news I get all day, all week, all month. Come tell me. Or tell somebody else. Folks, it's the greatest news you're ever going to hear. There's nothing better. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for being the the relentless hound of heaven. Lord, that you would leave everything, that you'd leave perfection, that you would leave your Father, that you would leave the glory of heaven, and that you would come insert yourself into this jacked up, sin-filled world is so incredible to me. that you would love humanity that much, Lord, to make that incredible sacrifice and then to suffer and die the way that you did. There is no way that any of us can ever question the magnitude of your love for mankind because of what you did for us. So Lord, if you've, if you've expressed the greatness of your, of your love in that way, and if you didn't just stay in the tomb, but you rose again, proving that you have power over sin and death, proving that you have power over the things that, that kill us, the things that we run so hard after in this life that kill us, the things that we think that we'll find life in and it just kill us. But Lord, you are sovereign over those things. You are stronger than those things. You have defeated those things. And so you give us the the invitation to come and to have life. You give us the invitation, anyone, all people, everyone, to call out to you. Lord, save me. I'm hopeless, I'm broken, I'm desperately confused in this life. Lord, my soul is empty and I've been looking to every other thing to fill it.
And Jesus, I trust that you are the only thing that can fill it. And so, Lord, I call out to you today. I I repent of my sin, of my rebellion, of my running from you, and I turn, Lord, in repentance and run to you. And I call out for you, Lord, to save me. To be Lord of my life, Lord, to to begin the process of fixing what, what sin and rebellion has broken in my mind, in my soul, in my heart, in my relationships, perhaps marriage with kids, whatever, Lord, please begin to fix what sin and rebellion has broken. And Lord, fill me with your spirit. Allow my life to be lived with a purpose, Lord, an eternal purpose, something greater than myself. Lord, may I, may I live to please you. May I live to know you and experience your goodness. Jesus, thanks for loving me. You don't have to say those exact words, but just call out to him today if you haven't. And the rest of us who perhaps have in the past, there's a good chance that we have need in our lives of sozo. And there's good chance we have situations going on in our lives right now where we need to call out in humility to ask you to step in and to bring life. And so, Lord, may we not be so prideful as to to refuse to, to cry out to you and to ask for your help, to ask for your touch, to ask for your healing and your wholeness and your deliverance, Lord, whatever it is that we need. We know that you know what we need, and so we cry out to you today. Lord, thanks for this holy ground where we can stand before you and we can deal with the most important things, Lord, the things of eternity, the things of our souls. Lord, you're so good. And we're so thankful for your goodness and your love and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. We bless you. We thank you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.